Dear friends, uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Lata Reddy and I'm the chair of the Deccan Heritage Foundation in India. It is my honor to welcome you all to the third series of lectures on Deccan heritage, art and culture titled From Konkan to Coromandel. I welcome you on behalf of His Highness Srikanta Datta Wadiyar Foundation, the Center for Islamic Studies of the University of Cambridge and the Deccan Heritage Foundation, UK, as well as India. Our special thanks for their support to this initiative go to Her Highness Maharani Pramoda Devi Wadiyar, Neil Cunningham and Dr. Vivek Gupta of the Center for Islamic Studies, and Dr. Helen Philon of Deccan Heritage Foundation UK and Sri Kara of the Deccan Heritage Foundation India. Our speaker today is Manu Espillay, who is the well-known author of The Ivory Throne, published in 2015, Rebel Sultans, published in 2018, and The Courtesan, The Mahatma, and The Italian Brahmin, published in 2019. Formerly Chief of Staff to Shashi Tharoor, Member of Parliament, he is also a winner of the Sahitya Academy, Yuva Puruskar, in 2017. He is currently studying for a PhD at King's College London. His fourth book releases in September 2021, and I will have the privilege of releasing it in Bangalore on 24th September. The title of the book is a surprise, so we will keep it that way. On today's talk, Manu has chosen to speak on Begums and Maids, a history of the Deccan through its female protagonists. From the 13th century down to the 18th century, the Deccan was home to some remarkable women. Their contributions straddle everything from poetry and intellectual thought to war and diplomacy. Could we potentially then reconstruct the history of the Deccan through their eyes? In this lecture, Manu will highlight the lives, careers, and ideas of some of the key female figures of the late medieval and early modern Deccan. Covering the Sultanates as well as the Maratha state and featuring Begums and Ranis as well as a kitchen maid, we will discover how these women challenged, received wisdom and tropes and expressed ideas so bold that they still resonate. Together, they encapsulate a fascinating chapter of Indian history that can tell us a lot about politics, dissent, and how we ourselves perceive the past and its inhabitants. With that, I will hand it over to Manu. And uh, Manu, we're all looking forward greatly to your lecture and uh, the unusual topic that you have chosen. Thank you. Thank you, Lata, for that kind introduction. I'm glad you mentioned the ivory throne in the introduction because Frankly, it was the six years that I spent working on that book that alerted me to the importance of just looking at history and political history through these female protagonists. Because uh, for want of better terms, my antagonist and protagonist in that book were women. The men were very much sidelined. They were, the, they were often reduced to uh, non-entities. And the so-called good uh, side, side of things, the so-called bad side of things, all of this was sort of you could see all of it in these female characters and they, they, in their own different ways, the two women in that book, the Maharani's of Travancore, changed history. Um, I must, of course, at the beginning also say that I will not be showing slides, partly because the, the women of the Deccan that I'm speaking of, there aren't any images, for most of them. And it would be a little bit of an irony if I were to title my talk, uh, you know, around female protagonists and then uh, put up slides that feature their sons and husbands, because those are the ones who, those are the people who got painted as opposed to the women. Now, women in Indian history, mythology, you know, our, our politics, 
It's always a fascinating subject. Some scholars like Romila Thapur, for example, have studied how Shakuntala and the trans translation uh, of, of the character and the retellings of the character across different periods tell us so much about evolution of ideas towards women in Indian society. So you have a very bold and forthright Shakuntala in the Mahabharata. But by the time you come to Kalidasa, she's a very coy, docile uh, type of person, which tells us more about how society viewed these women rather than the original story. Uh, so the original has one kind of woman and later retellings have another. Uh, same with Ahalya in the Ramayana. You know, in, in the Ramayana, when Indra, the king of gods, comes to Ahalya disguised as her husband, um, she's not actually fooled. She knows that this is a disguise. She knows it's not her husband. But the Ramayana allows her a kind of curiosity. It allows her a kind of desire, which, however, uh, later retellings of the Ramayana got very uncomfortable with. And they decided, look, let's just expunge this and pretend that, uh, that Ahalya had no idea what was happening. So you see that you know, even in mythology and the way it is, it's encapsulated and retold, there are lots of things that change over time. A uh, recent scholarship by, uh, by Harshita uh, Kamath, for example, has even told us of the 17th century poet in the Deccan, uh, Shetriya, and how a lot of the compositions ascribed under this male name may have actually emerged from courtesans and Devadasis and Vaishyas. And I think it's important, therefore, to speak of these female protagonists. And if we do discuss Deccan history, to pay some more attention, not just to the kings, not just to the economic trends, not just to uh, the politicians of the time, but also these women, because there's something dated. Now, at the, at the start, you mentioned that you know, the, the, the span of time covered is from the 13th century to the 18th, rather end of 13th century to the 18th. But I'll begin with somebody who is from the 13th century prior to the Islamic period. So the, the main canvas that I, I'm, I'm going to paint is of the Islamic period from the time Alauddin Khilji invades till, of course, the rise of Shivaji in the late 17th century. But just to start with, in the 13th century, of course, the Deccan saw the, the remarkable queen Rudrama Devi, the queen of the Kakatiyas. And this was, of course, a fascinating person because her father, Ganpati Deva, by, by the accounts that we have, he groomed her to be his heir, which sort of irritated some of the other male members in the family, some of whom are said to have stood up to Rudrama Devi later. She was not only groomed in a, in a political sense, she was also told, perhaps, that she had to behave like a king. And you see Rudrama Devi, the, the, the accounts that we have tell us that she dressed like a man. She used to lead her troops into battle. Uh, and she, in, in, in every sense, she sort of behaved like a king uh, rather than a queen, in, in, you know, if you were to segregate the two terms. But if you think of it another way, you see that in politics, perhaps when women were thrust into positions of power or where they had to manage power alongside the politics of gender, sometimes perhaps it was better to do it that way. You find, for example, this whole thing that Rudrama Devi styled herself Maharaja, never a Maharani. She was, uh, she was titled a Maharaja. And you have this resonate in different parts of the Indian subcontinent. In, in Travancore, for example, as late as the 1920s, when Setu Lakshmi Bhai was the ruler, or she was the regent, as the British called her, uh, she was styled Pura Adam Tirmal Maharaja, uh, not Maharani. In the, in the early 19th century, when the British resident Colonel Munro was looking into a into a succession dispute there, he was stunned to find that a reference to a 17th century king called Ashwati Pirin Raja was actually a reference to a woman who just had the title of king. You find that in the Deccan, Deccan families took these ideas to other places. The, the famous Gwalior queen, Baizabai in the 19th century, when she became regent of, of the Gwalior state after her husband died, he had no heir, so Baizabai was in control. She adopts a boy, but she tells the British that she has no intention of relinquishing power when the boy uh, comes of age. She intends to be ruler for life. And then once she's gone, the boy can succeed. Of course, the British don't let that happen. But it tells us that Indian women, when they were in positions of power, while it may have been awkward in certain ways, there were also certain ways by which they owned that power and they were able to exercise it quite effectively. Now, um, uh, I, now, this is this is all about you know Rudrama Devi and the early phase. Coming to the Deccan itself, you know one of the one of the things that I discovered when I was working on my book Rebel Sultans was that right at the start when Alauddin Khilji invades the Deccan, he's heading for the capital of the Yadavas of Devagiri in 1296. He doesn't meet much resistance because the Yadava army is elsewhere engaged in battle with southern enemies. They, they're not aware that there's this invasion coming up from the north. But the, the little bit of resistance he does face is from a, a, a sort of warlord on the way, uh, 
And with the warlord are two women who are fighting. And there's this wonderful uh, reference in a chronicle which says that they fought like lionesses. So right at the start of Kilji's invasion, you find the presence of women. Similarly, in 1296, when he does take, uh, when he does defeat the Yadava king of Devagiri, one of the things some of the accounts say that, you know, the, the Yadavas had to also part, besides, you know, parting with jewelry, parting with gems and money, they also had to part with a daughter. So you also see this whole idea of a princess or a female character becoming a trophy of war, you know, the, a, a person who is, is moved from her father's place and becomes the, the wife or the, or, the, or the, you know, she's taken into the harem of the invader. But even that cliche, in a way, of women being trophies of war, women just being these objects that are traded between different dynasties, you know, there are these men on the political chessboard, and as they form their political alliances, you find that these women are often exchanged in marriage alliances. Uh, but even these women, even these marriages were not devoid of meaning, you know, they often did not necessarily lead to these women being passive in any way, nor did they mean that, you know, the politics because of that marriage, somehow everything was smoothed out and, and you know, things just pro proceeded thereafter. For instance, Feroz Shah Bamini in 1406 married uh, Princess of Vijayanagara. He had defeated Devaraya the first of, of Vijayanagara, managed to uh, not only extract a lot of treasure, but also got a Vijayanagara princess as his bride. Uh, and of course, you know, the story goes that even before the wedding ceremonies were over, even before the ceremony itself had come to a close, uh, the two men had already fallen out. And this princess, of course, went back with her Bahmani husband to the Bahmani state, while the Vijayanagara father and Vijayanagara started stewing again in rage. And of course, war resumed once again. You find Sanjay Subramanian has this, uh, has this account he's found, I think, from the Dutch records, where he talks about, or the Portuguese records, where he talks about how in the early 1500s, marriage was offered by the Vijayanagara emperor again, uh, to the Portuguese, where the then Vijayanagara emperor, who had just come in, you know, after a coup, the, the, the family was very new, and they needed allies. Uh, one of the things the then emperor proposed to the Portuguese was that he would send a daughter to King Manuel in Portugal, and that Manuel might send a daughter to Vijayanagara, and thereby the Portuguese, who were beginning to dominate and control the seas, they, in alliance with Vijayanagara, which dominated the Indian Peninsula, would form some kind of uh, grand alliance and, and, you know, change politics and so on. Of course, it never worked out. But here again, you find that the, the idea of a woman and marriage being used to cement a political alliance. Finally, when Vijayanagara falls in 1565 at the Battle of Talikota, of course, the empire continues in a weakened state. But, you know, that was, a, for all practical purposes, Vijayanagara was past its peak once it collapsed, uh, after uh, once the capital was sacked after Talikota. Even there, Vijayanagara had been playing the different sultanates of the Deccan one against the other. Ramaraya of Vijayanagara was a very shrewd politician. But when the sultans woke up and realized that they were being played, they decided to form an alliance against Ramaraya. And again, it was through marriage. It was again through their daughters that the alliance was solidified because uh, Hussein Nizam Shah of Ahmednagar gives a daughter to the Adil Shah of Bijapur. Adil Shah sends a princess the other way. And thus, you know, they, they get their daughters intermarried into these different royal dynasties, and that's how they come together and end up defeating Vijayanagara. So there again, women are present, seemingly in a passive way, seemingly in a way where they don't really change the fortunes of, of politics or, or of these kingdoms much. They're just sort of side figures. And yet there are clues which suggest that Perhaps they weren't side figures after all. There's a, a sarcastic statement from Kafi Khan, the Mughal chronicler, who says, uh, it was a divine mystery that whenever the rulers of the Deccan gave one another a daughter for the purpose of gaining peace, no girl was at ease in her husband's house and it ended up causing more problems. And this is actually entirely true because, as I said, these women, even if they seem passive, they were not necessarily passive, which meant that once they went into these new courts, they often had their own agendas, they often had their own ideas of politics, and they often did change and, and affect the destinies of these kingdoms into the future. Now, when the Bahmani state, for example, is in its early phases, you find that it's the, it's, it's, uh, uh, the first Bahmani sultan's wife. It, she goes on a, on, a, on a hajj to Mecca. And from there, she initiates con uh, contacts with the Abbasid Caliph and tries to get him to recognize the Bahmanis as an independent power. In that very delicate and important negotiation, you find a woman playing a role. And of course, she succeeds and, and the Bahmanis are recognized as legitimate rulers. The, the celebrated Mahmud Gawan in the late 1400s, you know, he, his rise to power as regent of the Bahmani kingdom. In fact, he perhaps delivered the Bahmani state uh, its final 
a flash of glory before the whole thing started collapsing and the successor states or the later Delhi Sultanate, uh, Deccan Sultanates came into play. His success depended a great deal on the support of the Sultan's mother and the widow of the previous Sultan, namely Begum Nargis. And his fall and his, the decline in his relationship with the next ruler, uh, and which ultimately culminates in his execution, also begins after the Begum passes away, which means, again, it's a small clue, but you see that she definitely has an important role to play in holding the balance of power, in sort of keeping things uh, you know, in check and not allowing internal rivalries and feuds to, to destabilize and topple the entire system that was there. Now, of course, because you know, we're talking about the Bamni and the, and the early Vijayanagara period, the evidence is relatively slender. As I said, these women seem to make only cameo appearances and we have to sometimes read between the lines to make sense of their, their full contributions. But as you move further down into the 16th and 17th centuries, they come into better sort of you know, visibility. You start seeing more and more of these, these royal women and what they're doing, the Begums from the title of the lecture. I'll get to the maids in the second half. So, for instance, you know, when, when uh, Yusuf Adil Khan sets up what becomes the Bijapur Sultanate or the Adil Shahi Sultanate, he, of course, has a very interesting story in his own right. You know, there are different uh, origin myths, if you will, around him. One says he was this long lost son of the Ottoman emperor who was hidden away for his safety uh, because a rival brother wanted to kill him and therefore constructs a royal genealogy for him. Another says, no, he was just one of many other immigrants who came to the Deccan to make their fortune and initially worked as a cook. And, you know, it was very much from humble beginnings that he made himself noticed through wrestling and, you know, uh, martial prowess, and then became the Yusuf Adil Khan that we know. Either way, he founds what is the Adil Shahi dynasty. But right at the start, the founding of the dynasty also depends on his wife. And this wife is a local Maratha Hindu woman, the sister of a man called Mukund Rao Kadam. And again, she's not merely a wife. She's not merely somebody her brother handed over to the king and she passively accepted that role. You see that, you know, she firstly, as a mother, even if you do focus on her role as a wife and mother, as a mother, her son obviously became the next Adil Shah, Ismail, and a daughter married the Nizam Shah of Ahmednagar. So she's got two of her children in positions of, of influence. But more importantly, you see her importance and the fact that she definitely enjoyed a certain kind of uh, prominence at court and a certain capacity to, to sort of alter politics and move the chessboard, the, the pieces on the chessboard in her own right. When her son dies and then the succession of the grandson occurs and she finds that one grandson isn't very much up to the mark and she joins a faction of nobles to get rid of him and replaces him on the throne with another uh, grandson. The second grandson, by some accounts, was illegitimate. So very clearly, she wasn't being sentimental. She wasn't being uh, a grandmother in that sense. She was clearly playing some kind of a political role. So there you have Mukundra Kadam's uh, sister in the Adil Shai Sultanate right at the beginning. You go a few decades later to Ahmednagar next door, which is the Nizam Shahi Sultanate. And you find that there, Hussein Nizam Shah, who was the king who you know, fought uh, against Vijayanagar at that sensational battle in 1565 at Talikota. His wife, Khunza Humayun, was also clearly a force to reckon with. Uh, there are, I think, in the tarif e Hussein Shahi, you find almost an erotic uh, description of her beauty and her appearance and things like that, of the king's great affection and love for her. Uh, one of the stories uh, goes that Talikota was provoked because uh, Ramaraya of Vijayanagara sent in uh, uh, an audacious demand of tribute to the, to the Nizam Shah of Ahmednagar. And essentially, he, of course, said, you know, your gems, your jewels, your elephants, whatever. And then added a line where he said also the anklets of the Begum, uh, which, which essentially meant that if a, a foreign king was asking for your wife's anklets in tribute, he was obviously insulting you. And that is what led to the Battle of Talikota. Obviously, it's a wonderful story. So the battle took place for various reasons. But again, the presence of Kunza Humayun is, is clear there. And once Hussein Nizam Shah wins at Talikota, he, he dies soon thereafter. And for the next over six or seven years, it's his wife who's in control in Ahmednagar. In fact, there was this uh, man called Said Murtaza who, who tries to conspire against her and expel her from power, does not succeed. And he immediately has to flee to a neighboring state because he knows she will not be kind uh, you know, now that the coup has failed. Her son seems uh, to resent her at, to some level because she refuses to give, uh, give up power, a little bit like Baizabai in the 19th century, who I mentioned before. Uh, Kunza Humayun is also quite capable of wielding power. She has her battle strategy. She has all kinds of uh, you know, involvements in politics at court. And she's very comfortable in her position. Eventually, as one scholar said, a, a group of 
uh, nobles get together and they get rid of this petty court government and she, the, the lady is imprisoned and her son comes to power. And at some point you find that even the, the paintings in the tarif e Hussein Shahi, which feature uh, Khunza Humayun are slowly sort of scratched over and in some places she's turned into a giant smudge. Perhaps it, it, it reflects somebody's you know, discomfort with women and royal women who are supposed to be in Parda painted, but potentially it could also uh, you know, be, some, be that somebody was not very happy with her being commemorated that way. Either way, what we know is that Kunza Humayun was definitely somebody of political importance and not a minor figure in the court of the Nizam Shahis. Of course, her daughter is very famous, Chan Bibi, at that Battle of Talikota, the marriage alliances that took place prior to that. She was sent from Ahmednagar to Bijapur. And of course, her story is very well known. I won't go too much into it. But briefly, her husband, uh, she's some kind of an advisor to him. We hear that she advises him in court matters, in policy matters. He dies, unfortunately. She tries to be regent. A group of nobles oust her. She has a stint in prison. Eventually, she, 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 she's released from prison, but she realizes she has no future at the Bijapur court. She returns to her father and her brother's kingdom, which is Ahmednagar, the Hussein Shahi court, or the Nizam Shahi court. And there she becomes, after a few years, uh, the, the chief power broker. When in the 1590s, you have the Mughals starting to invade the Deccan. And of course, Ahmednagar is first, uh, you know, at the, right at the frontier then. That's where the Mughals are coming in from. And you find that there are different factions, different nobles in different groups. Each has a candidate that they want to put forward. Ultimately, it's Chan Bibi who succeeds. Her candidate is the one recognized. She manages to marshal enough support through her diplomacy and her, her sort of you know, uh, lobbying with different factions at court. And when the Mughals invade, she's the one who uh, even leads the resistance, military resistance against them. It's successful the first couple of times. She manages to get aid from her nephew in Bijapur. She manages to hold them off initially. But eventually, uh, you know, Prince Daniel himself comes uh, to, uh, to uh, Ahmednagar. She realizes that she can't sustain an, in an indefinite kind of siege and decides to come to terms. Naturally, it upsets a bunch of nobles at court and she is assassinated. Her mother was thrown into prison. In her case, you know, the, the lady was killed. Now, at this stage, the famous Malikambar, of course, comes in. And uh, a quick note here to say that he also uses his daughter and marriage. He gets his ma daughter married to the next Nizam Shah and uses that as a means to control the man. Of course, when the man gets too big for his boots, he gets rid of the man, has another Nizam Shah installed, his little boy, and continues to wield power. But there again, you see the importance of the daughter. In the 1630s, now we return to Bijapur, you see yet again a woman playing uh, a role of great importance, which is Khadija Begum. Now, Khadija Begum is the sister of the Qutub Shahi king, which is in Golconda. The Khadija Begum, in some ways, because you know, she's in the 17th century, and again, we have more material about her, including from Dutch sources, uh, we can sort of construct a fuller political personality for her. What you see, you know, if, if anybody's run any reading on the Deccan, you find that uh, because of the fact that the Deccan was a magnet for immigrants from the Persian world, you know, traders, merchants, uh, intellectuals, Sufis, fighters, and so on. It had a huge uh, influence of these immigrants or the foreigners or the Afakis, which became one political faction. And then there was a Dakhni political faction, which was basically local Muslims, Marathas, the Africans who, who did not quite fit in Nogel with the, with the Persians. And these were the two broad uh, political divisions in the Deccan courts. And you see this in the Bahmani period and later in the successor states as well. And in the 1630s, you have a situation where as late as 1631, the Bijapur court is at war with Golconda. These kingdoms are always fighting over frontiers and forts and so on. But at this point, the Mughals have started to come in. And the then the authorities in Bijapur essentially go up to the Qutub Shah in Golconda and say, look, forget our, our, our disputes, forget our quarrels for now. We've got a bigger enemy to face. Let's ally together and fight the bigger enemy. It is in that political agreement and that political transaction that you find uh, Khadija Begum being married by the, her brother, the Qutub Shah, into the family of the Adil Shah. She becomes the Adil Shahi Begum, and she comes to Bijapur in the year 1633. Um, now, within three years, you realize that she's obviously got influence. She's obviously very quickly managed to, uh, to corner a lot of clout at court. Because at the time in the Bijapur court, you've got two factions. You've got a man called Mustafa Khan, who's favorable to coming to terms with the Mughals. Don't fight with them, use diplomacy, come and, and form peace with the Mughals. And you have another side, there's a man called Khawas Khan, 
assisted by a military general called Murari Pandit, who's a Brahmin, who say, no, we must fight the, the Mughals and not come to terms with the Mughals. What's interesting is that Kavas Khan and Murari Pandit are, represent the Dakhni faction. Mustafa Khan represents the Afaki or the Western or the foreign Persian faction, which tells us something also about how you know, the loyalties were perhaps and, and, and strategies were perhaps divided between these two different factions as well. Kavas Khan, for instance, is supposed to have been, some say he was a Habshi or an African. Some say he was a Maratha of a relatively low caste. Some say he was a mix of both, you know, potentially had an Abyssinian father, but also uh, a, a mother who was local Maratha. And Murari Pandit was a Brahmin. So as these local, you know, Dakhni people, they were very keen to fight the Mughals and not, uh, on, on, not, on, not on board as far as, you know, coming to terms went. Whereas the Persian element, because you see somebody like Khunza Humayun, she was related, it is said, to Bairam Khan, who was Mughal Emperor Akbar's Abga, Abga, regent. So obviously there, was, there were contacts because of that Persian connection with people at the Mughal court. Therefore, the Persian faction was happy to come to terms with the Mughals as opposed to the Afaki, the, the Dakhni faction. This is where Khadija Sultan comes into the, into the picture. The story goes, of course, some of this may be exaggerated. Some of it may be created retrospectively to even you know, sort of smear her with, with negativity. But the idea is that she was either her brother was insulted at her wedding or she herself was insulted by this Murari Pandit and Khawas Khan. Because soon after she comes to court in 1633, she sets herself against this faction, which is then dominant at court, supports the Mustafa Khan faction. And her support obviously tilts the scales of power again, because you find that in six, three years later, in 1636, Khawas Khan is killed. Murari Pandit has his tongue cut, he's paraded through the streets, dragged on, uh, you know, his, his limbs are cut off and he's dragged by a horse through the streets of Ahmednagar, and that faction is out. This faction, the Persian faction, uh, rises up, and in the same year, you have uh, the, the Adil Shahis coming to terms with the Mughals. So obviously, there was some role she played. Obviously, there were several other factors in play as well, but the Begum's influence cannot be discounted. Similarly, Khadija Begum had something to do in terms of relations with the Dutch. And this, she wouldn't be the first one here. In the reign of the Vijayanagara king Venkata II, uh, the, the Portuguese, of course, had representatives at his court who were Jesuits. And they were sort of angling for the Portuguese and they were on good terms with Venkata, the emperor. But then at some point, the emperor switches and he starts sort of flirting with the Dutch. And the Portuguese themselves record that the reason is the influence of a new queen who, whose family was in favor, or rather they favored the Dutch. So obviously you find that in other courts also queens could uh, you know, determine uh, these kind of you know, relationships with foreign trading companies as well. And in Khadija's case, we have this lovely anecdote in, in, and lovely sort of record in the, in the Dutch archives, which talks about how she went on the Hajj in the early 1660s, and it was on a Dutch ship. It was the Dutch who escorted her. It was they who protected her and took her there and sort of helped her get back, which seems to have worked very well because a ship that carried her baggage and her treasure and so on and was not protected by them was, you know, it was attacked by pirates and sank. So the fact that the Dutch protected her seems to have mattered. And when she came back, she referred to their profound, her profound friendship for the Dutch. She sort of uh, described the Dutch um, governor, I think at Pulikat, as the lion of the water and so on. Which, you know, and, and, and the... The, the implication actually would mean it would be that you know the queen obviously had something to do in terms of negotiating the relations between the Dutch company and her husband's government. Of course, finally, uh, Khadija Begum's story does not end very well in that uh, the, her husband, the Adil Shah, doesn't seem to have had any legitimate children. She doesn't seem to have had any sons either. And uh, the story goes, she raised a boy and he became the successor to the throne. Uh, all kinds of stories exist around this boy. Some say he was a, a, a maid son and the Begum just raised him. Some say, you know, he was perhaps a distant relative of the family. Either way, her choice of installing this particular boy whom she had raised, but she was not his mother, on the throne gave Aurangzeb, the Mughal emperor, at that time he was a prince in the 1650s, it gave him a pretext to attack uh, Bijapur once again. So she, in some ways, played a role in coming to terms with the Mughals and sort of, you know, pledging allegiance to the Mughals in the 1630s. And yet, towards the end of her career, you find that, you know, the, the same Mughals are back and they're about to devour the state. And, you know, Khadija Begum's, uh, Begum's son is, is, you know, he, he offers the pretext. His so-called illegitimacy offers the pretext. Now we, you know, go back into the, you know, she, as I said, she came from the family of the Qutub Shah of Golconda. And the Qutub Shahis have similar female characters there. You know, Ibrahim Qutub Shah in the, in the mid-1500s, he, he fell out with his brother who had seized power and he spent 
uh, well over half a decade in Vijayanagara. And he's said to have really Teluguized himself there, you know, picked up a lot of Hindu influences, etc. He, you know, the, there's the oral account of his famous wife, Bhagirati Bai, who's supposed to have been the mother of his heir, Muhammad Kuli Kutub Shah. Now, here again, you see that the mother's influence and background comes to serve the son very well. Because uh, when Ibrahim Kutub Shah dies in, I think, in the year 1580, uh, the young boy, Muhammad Kuli, is only 15 years old. There are other sons also who claim uh, you know, the, the throne rather than Muhammad Kuli. And what helps Muhammad Kuli is the support of a very important nobleman called Rai Rao. And the story goes that either Rai Rao was related to, to Bhagirati Bai, or simply the fact that Bhagirati Bai was Hindu and therefore you know, they felt that you know, she was part of their camp and it would be advantageous to back the, the candidate with the Hindu mother. Rai Rao decided to throw his, his support uh, behind Bhagirati Bai's son and that's how Mahmud Kuli uh, Kutub Shah was, was installed in power. Bhagirati Bai, we don't know much about her, but we do know a lot more about Mohammed Kuli's daughter, Hayat Baksh Begum. Hayat Baksh Begum, you know, the, she was his, I mean, he, does, he didn't have any sons. So it was essentially through her that the succession was routed when her cousin whom she married became the next Kutub Shah of Golconda. And Hayat Baksh Begum was somebody whose hand in marriage was sought even by the Shah of Iran. By, I think, you know, it would not be too far fetched to sort of speculate that by marrying her cousin and staying home, she sort of was able to stay in control of local politics rather than shipping herself off to another court and becoming uh, a, a part of the, the, the Persian emperor's harem there. And we find that she also continues to play a lot of uh, influence, wield a lot of influence from behind the throne because her husband wasn't a terribly impressive ruler. Uh, her son wasn't a terribly impressive ruler. And in the 1650s, by which time Hayat Pakshvegam is a very old lady, at the same time, or around the same time that Aurangzeb attacks Bijapur also, he then comes to Golconda. And here again, after the siege of Golconda, and it's very clear that Aurangzeb's winning and it's not going to be easy to get him to back off, it is Hayat Paksh Begum who goes out into his camp, who goes before the enemy and negotiates a treaty with him. The treaty is not favorable to Golconda in the sense that she has to hand over a granddaughter to Aurangzeb's son, and that son is then recognized as the heir to the Qutub Shahi throne. But what's important is that it was the queen mother, it was the dowager who went out and negotiated the treaty with the invader and, and clearly suggesting that she was somebody of influence. In fact, uh, her son fell out. And one of the reasons the Mughals were able to invade Golconda was that a very powerful um, uh, nobleman, Mir Jumla, who practically controlled the government, had fallen out with her husband, with her, with uh, Hyde Baksh Begum's son. And one of the, I mean, this is gossip perhaps, but it's interesting how much gossip can also tell you that the, the story goes that one of the reasons uh, the Qutub Shah was annoyed with Mir Jumla was not only that he had acquired and cornered a lot of power and essentially emasculated the king, but also because there were stories that Mir Jumla had some romantic mix-up with the queen mother. It's gossip, but again, in the gossip, you see reflected that the queen mother's presence, her importance, is in a, in a sort of tangential way recognized even in that slightly salacious story. Then, of course... You know, this is all the sultanates. I, I know we're running out of time, but it's not easy to not speak of the, the Marathas because we know that Shivaji's uh, ascent, he, there were times when he did not see his father for as many as 12 years. And all the traditional accounts speak in one voice about the influence of his mother. She came from a family that was higher in social status than his father's family. Uh, she was in, in many ways what we would now call a single uh, parent, you know, she did not have her husband's support for, for the years, for many of the years in which she was raising her son. Uh, she also claimed descent from the old Yadavas of Devagiri, de uh, defeated by Alauddin Khilji in the 1290s. So clearly she was, a, she was a woman who came from a political family. Her father was a very important nobleman in the Nizam Shahi court. And she seems to have imbibed in her son uh, a, a certain set of values and certain ideas that allowed him to perhaps when the, when the political sands were shifting in the Deccan and the Sultanates were on their last legs, Shivaji did not seek either an accommodation with the Mughals, although he was forced into that at one point, nor was he content being just another nobleman or landowner or landholder under the existing system. The very fact that he was able to audaciously or even boldly consider the idea of kingship, potentially one could read it as coming from, stemming from the fact that he claimed this kind of genealogy through his mother and his mother may have imbibed in him certain ideas and certain values, given her political, her family's political history. Shivaji, of course, had two sons, Sambaji. He uh, was killed by the Mughals and his widow and son were taken into the into Aurangzeb's camp. Uh, 
The other son, Rajaram, his wife Tarabai again plays an important role in the fortunes, the political fortunes of the Deccan. Tarabai, at one time uh, after her husband dies in the year 1700, she immediately installs her son on the throne and then starts wielding power. She's the one giving orders to send out uh, troops into Mughal territory and raid in Mughal territories rather than purely taking, uh, uh, purely taking a, a defensive uh, posture. She gets rid of her co-wife by imprisoning her and imprisoning that lady's son. She sort of, you know, is capable of being very Machiavellian. Of course, eventually she loses out. The, the boy that Aurangzeb took with him from the family is released back onto the political, uh, you know, landscape of, of the Maratha state, splitting the Maratha court. You find that Tarabai eventually loses out to the same co-wife she had locked up. She disappears for nearly 30 years. And she's, she's a complete bit player in, in, the, in Maratha politics. And this is, so she disappears around 1715, say. She's not a big player then. 1749, when King Shah, who's you know, on his, in his final year and he's dying, he doesn't have an heir. Tarabai realizes she has an opportunity here to once again seize power, once again become a political actor. She claims that she had a grandson of royal blood whom she had hidden away. And then, you know, resurrects this boy and says, ah, here's your heir. Of course, intending to manipulate the boy and wield power through him, uh, it fails because the boy, once he's installed, other people sort of gravitate towards him. He gets very confident of his own position and starts ignoring Tarabai, at which point she claims that he's a nobody. She just invented the story and he was just some bard she found on the streets. And, you know, uh, poor lady, of course, doesn't manage to get as much clout as she would like. But she's again one person who sees something else that's happening in the Maratha court, which is the shift of power or the, or the tilting away of power from the hands of the king into the hands of the prime ministers, the Brahmin hereditary prime ministers called the Peshwas. And she's, the, she's one person who warns against it. She's one person who decides to stand up to the Peshwas and try and thwart it. Again, she doesn't succeed. It's too late in the day. And by the time she dies in the, in the 1760s, if I'm not wrong, she's a very old woman. She has her little fief. She has her little core domain where she's influential. She's regained authority, even in, if in so narrow a domain, and she's back to some position of confidence. So that's our, our, our Maratha queen. I won't go on. I had another story to tell from the 19th century, but I realized that I've gone on about the Begums and forgotten all about the maids in our title. This is essentially, is, the talking of the maids is essentially to talk also about the intellectual contributions of women to the politics and to the, to the culture of the Deccan in this period, from the 14th century to the 18th century. You know, you find that already uh, in, in the 12th century, you have somebody like Akka Mahadevi in Karnataka. You know, she's not, uh, she's not somebody who is merely about devotion and God. In her poetry, in her vachanas, you find clear ideas that are of dissent, of standing up to patriarchal institutions, of standing up even to institutions like marriage and, and standing up to men. You know, there's, uh, she's, she's married to a Jain prince. She's not very interested in marriage. You find that one of the, the stories about her says that she had three conditions when she agreed to marry him. One, that she would not give up her god, which is Shiva, because her husband was a Jain. That he must not come between her and her guru, and that he must not come between her and her uh, fellow uh, Shaivites, Veda Shaivas. Unfortunately, the man, the husband goes and, and thwarts and sort of breaches all of these uh, conditions that he had agreed to. In, in one story, she's meditating in front of her Shivalinga and this man is possessed of desire and decides to almost force himself on her. And she decides that's it, you know, I'm not going to stay here anymore. She discards her clothes and says, you're doing all this for this, you know, bag of flesh and bones. And she decides to walk out of the palace. And it's, she's aware very much that, you know, she's making a decision that is unconventional and potentially risky. For example, in one of her vachanas, she says, I'm no helpless woman. I utter no futile threats. I cannot be daunted. I shall dare hunger and pain. I shall steal out of withered leaves a wholesome meal and on pointed sword shall make my bed. I'm ready to dare the worst, to die this instant. The readiness is all that matters. The idea being that, I mean, even though she's saying she's ready for all these things, the vachana also essentially shows that she's aware that she's stepping into a very risky territory. This is a woman who's leaving the comforts of a palace, stepping out as a wandering naked saint, unsure, she doesn't have a roof over her head, nothing to eat. She's stepping out into territory that is not charted by most women, that is not open to most women, and she's yet boldly going out there. She says in another vachana, having built a house on mountain top, can you be scared of wild beasts? Having built a house on seashore, can you dread the waves and froth? Having built a house in the marketplace, can you fight shy of noise? Again, reflecting that she's aware of all the risks involved. She's aware of the fact that what she's doing uh, 
could potentially end up being life threatening but it's something she's willing to do she's taking a calculated decision there she's boldly stepping out she's in fact interrogated even by fellow veera shaivas when she gets there it's so difficult for a woman to break out of the institution of marriage they like you know why are you here why have you abandoned your husband you know you should be with your husband to which she says what use have i of husbands who die in dk throw them into the kitchen fires the one with no bond no fear no clan no no land no birth no death no place no form he is my husband now you can of course say here that you know she's talking about god and she's so devoted to god etc but this is also a way of rejecting an entire way of life and and you know charting out her own path and, and making her own autonomous choices aware entirely of the risks and perils this entails and she was by no means alone uh, you know that the, the saint lingam also from the veera shaivas has this lovely uh, poem where she says born on earth in a man's world trapped in karma and drowned in samsara i was immersed in darkness my mother tied a hu- husband to my neck father jangama which is jangama's veera shaiva saints blessed me with a linga and lo the darkness burst into light karma dissolved mind went empty i was free it's quite almost graphic you know the the idea of the mother tying a husband to her neck you know when women get married in india we put a, a locket around the neck which she sees very clearly in this poem as a kind of chain something that restrains her something that holds her back and yet this lady is articulating something greater an ambition a desire for something greater and this is happening at the late medieval period in the deccan now coming to uh, you know two final examples before i close you know as i said the, the islamic period is from the 14th century to the 18th so i've chosen two figures right at the start of that time and right at the culmination of that period the first is uh, a long standing favorite janabai who used to work in the saint namdev's house she was a kitchen maid and because of that reason you know although she had an intellectual bone in her she was interested in in ideas in in expressing herself unfortunately as a kitchen maid there were limits to even her physical mobility unlike namdev whom she served who was a man and could move around janabai had no such opportunities in fact in one of her poems she says that it would be better to become one of the the sluts of the bazaar you know one of the public women or a courtesan because at least that way i can move around and be free but here you know instead she comes up with poetry she comes up with a way of self expression in which god comes to the kitchen god helps her with tasks in the kitchen god helps her you know carry baskets of dung god helps pick lice from her hair she in a sense domesticates god but also makes it very clear that she doesn't enjoy this life of domestic drudgery in in a poem that is my favorite she says god my darling do me a favor and kill my mother in law i will feel lonely when she is gone but you'll be a good god won't you and kill my father in law i'll be glad when he is gone and you will be a good god won't you and kill my sister in law i will be free when she is gone i will pick up my begging bowl and be on the way let them drop dead then you and then we will be left alone just you and me it's not just about her seeking god it really is also about cutting off these things that chain her to the kitchen that chain her to a certain way of life now this is in the 14 uh, in the 14th century this is a person who you know 14th century is essentially the period when the two empires of the deccan vijayanagara and the De- and the bahmani empire are being consecrated this is an idea she expresses then what is interesting is that at the time these empires collapse the final deccan sultanates are on the verge of being annexed by the moguls in the in the 17th century there's a lady who lived in the 17th century by the name of bahina bai also in the maharashtra region also one of these bhakti saints also somebody we often reduce to just you know the idea of god and devotion but she also essentially complains of the same things that janabai did five centuries before telling us that you know ultimately no matter how much changes in politics no matter how many centuries pass some of these injustices that these females, fem- these women face uh, continued so for instance uh, she says uh, bahina bai says the vedas cry the purana shout that no good can come of a woman I was born with a woman's body how am i to it in the goal what sin did i do in an earlier life that i am now removed from god my body is a, my body is a man's with the shape of a woman again you know this is bahina the earlier one was janaba i see somebody is asking janaba was from the 14th century this is bahina bai in the 17th century and she dies the dawn of the 18th century in in bahina bai's case her poetry is very clear that she had a troublesome husband she had a husband she says is very scholarly he knows the vedas and he knows all the ritualistic ideas of religion but he's very insecure he's something of a wife beater he doesn't like the fact that she in some ways attracts more attention than he does at one point he threatens to abandon her 
And at this point, she, she, there's a somewhat uh, sad poem where she basically says, my husband's the soul, I am the body. My husband is all my good. My husband's the water and I am a fish in it. How can I survive without him? In a sense, she's making her peace with patriarchy. She says, look, ultimately, I can express all this. I'm not happy with it, but I suppose I'll have to make my peace. As I said, Janabai expressed something uh, in the, you know, centuries before where she was tied down by patriarchal institutions. And here you have centuries later, just before in, in the Shivaji period, you have this other lady, a Brahmin woman in the same region in Maharashtra, expressing the same thoughts, expressing that same feeling of, of wanting to rebel, but ultimately not being able to because of these institutions that were there. Now, you know, I've, I've spoken for a good 45 minutes. I, as I said, you know, we've got fascinating political characters in the Deccan. We've not necessarily focused on them beyond looking at them as wives and daughters and sisters and, and, and sort of consorts to this galaxy of male rulers who won battles and so on. Uh, and yet we often find that if we look a little closely, peel back a couple of layers, we start seeing something more of them and realize that despite the fact that the odds were often stacked against them, they were able to hold their own, they were able to achieve certain things and sometimes change the course of politics itself. So too we find in the Deccan, whether it's a kitchen maid or a Brahmin wife, there were women also expressing ideas. Uh, these were not powerful women, these were not rich women, these were not women of the court. These were, you know, ordinary women in ordinary places, often living in rural areas and villages. But they also laid claim to the world of ideas, to the world of, uh, of, of the intellect and, and the mind. And they wanted to make some kind of a difference and some kind of change as well. May not have succeeded, but, you know, I suppose we can learn from them. And in some ways, their messages still resonate, their messages still have value. And that is why their poetry and, and these, these things they wrote centuries ago still have meaning for us because, you know, we still see this, this, this happening in our own world, in our own time. Thank you. Thank you, Manu, for that wonderful lecture. Um, I just wanted to um, express just how wonderful it was to hear all of that. Um, I am, we're opening up the floor for questions, so please just write your questions in the chat box if you have any. Um, I can kick us off with uh, one question. Um, sorry, there's just one second. Um, yeah, so the first question that I do apologize, one second. You're on mute, really. Sorry about that again. Sorry. Um, the first question that I have um, that we can start with is um, you mentioned this issue of co-wives in history. Um, and I wonder whether or not uh, there was a way for you to make sense of how different gender roles um, existed in the past versus um, how we can communicate those issues to the present. In what sense, so if you could just clarify. I, so, I mean, obviously we have, you know, a category of women and we have, um, but, but I, I'm interested in how you can sort of think about how, I mean, we don't really have, we're not familiar with what a co-wife is now today. So I wonder whether or not you could talk a little bit more about how you get those sort of subtle issues of gender that existed in the past that don't necessarily exist in our world today. Well, you know, the, 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 a good place to look for this is frankly the Mughal court because you know you've got so much more data on the Mughals uh, that the, the evidence is stronger and therefore you can tell something more from the Mughal court. But you often find that, for instance, uh, one of the wives producing an heir or producing a son doesn't necessarily mean she will be the wife who raises the son. It could go that there, it could be that there was a senior wife who didn't have children and the child would be picked up from this wife and given to that wife to raise. And you do see something of this with uh, the first, uh, the second Adil Shah, where Ismail Adil Shah is born to a Maratha mother, to uh, Mukund Rao Kadam's sister. But the boy is raised by his Persian aunt because the aunts come from Persia. Uh, Ismail has a, a preference which comes out of this upbringing, even though he's part Hindu and part Maratha, he sort of prefers that Persian culture and the Persianate culture because he's been raised by a Persian aunt rather than his own natural mother. I think in the, in the Mughal court, you have similar examples where I think 
um, uh, Akbar's, uh, Akbar's son, uh, Jahangir, who was born from his Rajput wife, was raised by one of the other Begums in the harem as opposed to the natural mother. So, you, you know, there is obviously a kind of balancing here. There's, I think, a degree of formality also to this. And clearly, uh, some of these women did end up not getting along as well. You know, they would have different people supporting them. They have uh, different uh, agendas, different, uh, you know, no nobles who would sort of coalesce around them and, have, and try and lobby them for, for influence. Some of them would have military ranks and others would be lower in the hierarchy. All of these things came into play. Uh, so, you know, the world of the harem obviously was a very complex one in its own right. And I'm not, uh, since we see that in, in some detail with the Mughals, I wouldn't be surprised that even the Delhi, the Deccan Sultanates had something similar, where these wives were sort of jostling for. I think the broader point is that gender roles and the way in which women perform those gender roles are, are, are really the kinds of women, the kinds of roles that were available uh, were completely different than how we think about um, these roles today. Yeah. Um, and so I think that bringing that out when we speak of them is very important. I saw a first question from Tara's iPhone. Um, I don't know whether you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Tara? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. We can hear you. Oh, I, I was just wondering, yes. Uh, it's very interesting to go back in history and uh, looking at this four centuries of uh, change and time passing, you see that the uh, uh, gendered marginalization that has been working and the resilience of the women who, who have tried to work around this in their own way, succeeding in uh, uh, different degrees. And um, I was wondering what, I mean, even today we see that this issue hasn't gone away, although there is a lot more awareness and we are in the 21st century and we still kind of, you know, are, uh, are very primitive in many ways. And I was wondering uh, what this uh, kind of, you know, in spite of political uh, uh, changes and political formations um, uh, and ideologies, uh, the issues seem to persist. And uh, I was wondering what we learned from this, um, uh, you know, going back, which is very interesting and very complex and very insightful. Um, how do you uh, relate all this to, uh, you know, uh, the social relevance of today? Uh, could you kind of, you know, I, I provide think, you know, your perspective why, on that? Thank yes, you. Yes, I, I think this is why, you know, right at the start, I said that even talking about these women is not something we ordinarily do. And it's important to do that because yeah, the more we yeah. talk about it, the more you can sort of connect these past characters to the present, the, the poems and the vachanas that I read out, you know, it could have been written by somebody, of course, not in the same way, not in the same context, but the, the message in it is something that still resonates for a reason, because you can see that these women face something that you still face in today's world. And I think talking more about it, highlighting these stories more, uh, talking about the, the kind of roles the women played in that time, which were not just wife and mother, there were other uh, facets to them. You know, they had brains, they had political ambitions, they had other things to do as well. Merely talking about it and, and informing ourselves, I think, is an important thing in shifting attitudes a little bit. These are all long-term battles. There are no easy, immediate solutions yeah. to these things. You know, much of it has to be constructed slowly and, and imbibed slowly down multiple generations. There are studies of even how, you know, women in, in boardrooms were technically right up there, you know, CEOs and so on. You know, in a boardroom meeting, if a woman says something, you often find that the, the men may not even hear it. Whereas uh, a man says the same thing five minutes later, it gets noticed a little bit more. And these are things you hear even from people you know, you know, the, the women have these experiences even today. The world is still lopsided in that way. The rules are still in great measure made for not just men, but heterosexual upper caste men who often have a certain complexion or color. These are things that, that change with time. These are things that change with, I think, you know, uh, a, a so, sort of subtle and slow imbibement of, of, of just these stories and these ideas. I think that's why we need to talk more about them and get these stories told so that we can at least be a little more energetic in the way we fight these problems. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Kavya Sri Prithviraj. Um, uh, they ask, uh, are there any instances where the recording of history was in the hands of women? And if yes, what are some differences 
in the writing of history by man and woman? Um, I mean, I, the, that's the, the example I gave of the Shetraya poems and, you know, Harita Kamat's uh, research where she says that a number of the poems ascribed to Shetraya were actually perhaps written by Devadasis, by courtesans, you know, not necessarily by a man. Uh, there's, there's something there. You, uh, these are nameless women, so it's not like we can put a tag to it and say this was written by this person. Uh, you have something like the Madhura Vijaya, which was written by Ganga Devi, which was, she was either a wife or uh, one of the associates of uh, a Vijayanagara prince. She wrote, you know, what is essentially this epic type thing about Vijayanagara's conquest of the Madurai Sultanate, where, of course, she, she's, she follows the earlier patterns, you know, sort of plays up his heroism, his, his, his masculinity and all of that and his success and so on. You also have something like the Radhika Santpanamu by Muddupalni, which is an erotic poem from the 18th century, uh, which is different in that here it's not the man's pleasure and desire that is highlighted, but the woman's right to desire. It's Radha who really is the, the protagonist of the story. And Krishna ultimately has to satiate Radha and sort of appease Radha. She's the focus of that particular story. Um, you know, you've got all kinds of Telugu poetry that where you see women's voices. Men also often chose to sort of write in the, in the voices of women sometimes to communicate certain ideas. So if you look for it, I'm sure you can find uh, you know, things that might have meaning that you can perhaps connect the dots and then make an argument. So unfortunately, a lot of this is scattered. A lot of it necessarily, you know, it, it may not be in one language. Something, the Madhura Vijayam is, in, is, is a Sanskrit text. You have something else. Gulbadan is, is writing in Persian. You'll have something else in Telugu written by one of the courtesans. So, you know, these are spread across different languages in different places and so on. But perhaps if you combine it, we may be able to construct something interesting out of that. Yeah, I think here it's probably worth mentioning all the work that's been done on Rexy and Rex, and especially um, uh, the most recent, I mean, Celine Kidvai's work um, and Ruth Benita's work on women writing in India, um, who is Celine uh, who sadly passed away rather recently. Um, we have a question from Japya Sharma. Japya, can you unmute yourself? Hello. Am I on? Yes. Good evening, sir. I just wanted to ask that uh, the all the Begums and everyone you are telling about, so does uh, Begums of Bhopal, there were uh, four main, main Begums there. So does that also include in this? And uh, can you tell a few books that as a student I can read about the history or anything? The uh, Begums of Bhopal are much later period, 19th century. Sherir Khan, who's a descendant, wrote a lovely book on the Begums. Even though he's a descendant, he's not, you know, it, it's not a hagiographic kind of account. Uh, all four Begums are covered in it. There's another scholar who's written on it, but I forget the name. Uh, it's a, it'll come back to me at some point. But there, there are multiple books on the Begums. I can actually think of three, but I'm not getting the names in my head. But there are three books on the Begums of Bhopal that you can read. In fact, I think if you just search for it on Amazon, all three will show up. Sherir Khan's is, is, is a definite, uh, it's a very good book to go to because it's quite comprehensive. The others, I think, are focused more on individual Begums rather than all three or four uh, together. So yeah, you can so, choose So and individually, uh, if I uh, want to read any Begum, not only Bhopal, so uh, which are the books that I can read? I mean, if you're looking for an accessible introductory text, there's a lovely little volume by Ira Mukoti called Daughters of the Sun, where she condenses a lot of information on Mughal uh, women and not these are not necessarily ruling begums and so on. Some of them are just sisters and aunts and people who on the face of it are peripheral to the court, but she shows how they were actually quite central to court life and politics in those days. So look up Daughters of the Sun by Ira Mukoti. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We have a question from Amar. Amar, if you want to ask your question by voice, you have the opportunity to do so. Hello, am I audible? Yes. yes. Big fan, Manu, sir, first Thank of you. all. Yeah, I would like to ask that uh, once the Maratha ascendancy happens in Deccan, uh, we see this sudden disappearance of all the Sultanate families and descendants. I mean, this is unlike anywhere else seen in India. It means other families show some presence some or the other way politically or in militarily. But this does not happen in Deccan. Can you explain why does that seem? 
Well, I think there are a few families around, if you go to Bijapur and places who claim descent, there are definitely families who still have documents. I remember when I had a, had a book launch, when Rebel Sultans came out, a gentleman came up and showed me pictures on his phone of grants that were given to his ancestors by one of the Sultans. They're not descendants, but they are connected to the court. Um, I think one thing that may have played a role is that the capitals of the Deccan, with the exception of Hyderabad, sort of declined after the conquest of the Mughals. Because if you look at Bijapur, it became what you would now classify as a tier two or tier three town. Uh, the same with Ahmednagar, it sort of declined. It was not a, a very important center. Hyderabad, because the Nizams came and lived there, there was uh, some prominence to the city. But the other places, the, the, and, and of course, the Nizams had no intention of sort of glorifying the Qutub Shahs uh, too much. So it wasn't like their stories were told. Often the memories kept alive by poets, by others who are associated with these courts. So when the court disappears and the city loses prominence, you see that there's perhaps an exodus that takes place over time. And these cities, therefore, if there are no storytellers to tell stories, a lot of things don't get recorded. As a result of which, you know, who, uh, where the descendants went, you know, who went where, uh, who, whether there are any descendants, all of these things become, you know, they sort of fade away. We know that some of the Deccan sultans gave daughters to Mughal emperors. Uh, there was uh, Ibrahim Adil Shah II had a daughter who was married to one of Akbar's sons. Aurangzeb's son, as I said, was married to a Qutub Shahi princess. Another son was married to a Bijapur princess. And I think the Bijapur princess did briefly become Empress of India when her husband, if I'm not wrong, Bahadur Shah, briefly was Emperor of, of the Mughals. So I suppose there was some mixing with uh, the Mughals and therefore potentially some of, this, of, of, of these Deccan Sultanates have descendants among des descendants of the Mughals. But otherwise, no, I think they've sort of faded away, which happens. You find even the Bahmani Sultanate, you know, although the Bahmanis politically, they were emasculated by the end of the, of the, of the 15th century and definitely out of the picture by the 1530s in the, before the middle of the 16th century. Uh, you do find even later, there is somebody like Muntoji Bahmani, who's a saint, who's a Bhakti poet, but he claims to be a descendant of the Bahmani Sultan. So clearly members of the extended family sort of hung around for some time. But tracing their descendants in the present is, I would suspect, an almost impossible task. Thank you, sir. Looking forward to your next book. Thank you. We have a question from Joel Thomas Jason. Uh, hi, I'm a big fan of yours, Manu. Uh, so uh, my question is, um, I think that um, a lot of things repeat in history. You know, uh, the things happened in the past, happening now. Uh, there are so much similarities. So uh, as a historian, uh, do you think that when we seek into histories, when we seek our problems to the past, can we find solutions in the past which had happened, which is happening now? You know, the problems there's happening a, now. There's a wonderful line Srinath Raghavan used in an interview where he said, history doesn't teach any lessons, historians do. So I think, you know, we can get very romantic and try and construct lessons out of history. I think, you know, one of the reasons we often think, you know, history sort of rhymes and there are patterns we see is partly because ultimately history is made because of a lot of human actions also and human tendencies and impulses often across time, there are certain elements which stay, in, you know, regardless of time and context, which is perhaps why we relate to history this way and think that, oh, it's repeating itself and, oh, there are these patterns that are visible because ultimately human beings, you know, uh, whether it's a thousand years apart and despite different contexts, there are some impulses that, human beings show across time. So that could be, could be one reason. In terms of lessons from history, I mean, again, I, I don't want to romanticize and draw lessons and, and so on, because then that gets into very tricky territory. But I think reading history, enlightening ourselves about what things were in the past, contextually, not necessarily using our current filters to, to gaze at the past, but to try and withdraw these filters and to gaze at the past in its own, on its own terms, in its own time, that perhaps may give us a better understanding of the past. It may help us be a little, you know, more mature about the way we view history. It's not a clash of religions. It's not a clash of God knows what else. You know, it could, it's, it's a much more complex place, just as the world is complex today. You know, the past was also complex. And I think that's the only lesson I would uh, derive from history. I wouldn't use history to derive any other lessons for present day politics or present day other issues. Thank you, Manu. Um, our time is running low now, but we have one final question and it will go to Subhashni Ramachandran. Uh, good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. 
thank you for this lecture. It was amazing. Um, and I just wanted to ask, since uh, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Pillay has written a lot about uh, the matrilineal culture in in Kerala, I wanted to ask if there are any court poets in the uh, in the Kerala court, or in the um, in the Travancore court, who are very prominent. Uh, women, you mean? Yes. Yes. Sir. I mean, the only name comes up is a Kuttikunya Tangachi in the 19th century. She was uh, a poet of renown in that period. But before that, I can't really think of. I mean, you see women in temple uh, accounts giving donations. You see women present, often leading armies and fighting wars and so on. But poetry, not so much. I think Kuttikunya Tangachi is the one big name that pops up. Uh, there were there was something called the Nataka Shala, which had what was the equivalent of Devadasi's in the Travancore court. I'm assuming a lot of them were capable. A lot of them were talented you know, in, individuals who probably wrote poetry, etc. But uh, none of them seem to have achieved the kind of prominence that allowed them to be recorded as great poets. Uh, Swati Tirnal, the Maharaja, had a wife uh, called uh, Sundara Lakshmi, who was a dancer, but not a poet. Uh, so, you know, you have a few examples like that, but nothing that stands out, like, for instance, a Ganga Devi in Vijayanagara or a Muddu Palni, etc. I don't think I can think of any such examples. Did they hold uh, more economic positions than artistic ones? Or? Oh, women, naturally, because, of, because the whole logic of matriliny was that the woman was the owner. So, you know, as late as the early 19th century, the British admitted that, in theory, the queen was the proprietor, that's their word, it's a quote, of the state, and the king was just the manager. Uh, of course, the British then came and changed that. They couldn't tolerate the idea of women uh, having that kind of authority, and they sort of made the raja the head as opposed to the queen. Uh, but yes, they did have they did have political roles and economic control, as it was only in the 1930s that the Maharaja managed to snatch away from his aunt her hereditary ancestral estate, which once was the nucleus of an independent autonomous kingdom. Uh, so it was as late as the 20th century before that was taken away. Thank you so Thank much. You, I look forward to your next book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manu, for your fascinating lecture.